slips. So obviously we're here to talk about the referendum <clears throat> that we have coming up in February. A um, couple topics that we have for today's discussion and we are diving a little bit deeper than the overview information that I provided uh, last month. Why do we need more money? Um, what about reassessment? How does that play into all of this? And then we're gonna dive in a little bit more deeply on the projects here at William Penn. So just as an overview and a reminder, um, there's two different kinds of requests that we are seeking your approval for from in February. Operating versus capital, um, they can both, you know, they can both pass and that's our hope, but they are voted on independently so we could get a split decision. Um, <clears throat> the operating request, again, it provides money for the day-to-day -day operations of the district. Um, any, any number of things that we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis to run our schools comes out of our, our operating dollars. The, <clears throat> the capital portion is really for those renovation projects um, and the ask there is that we go to the state with them to issue bonds and those bonds get paid back over time um, but you're authorizing us to go go issue that debt basically on behalf of the district that then we repay back so the first part of my presentation tonight really does focus on the operating side of the request <clears throat> So one of the things that we have heard, um, or really that comes up anytime um, a school district goes out to seek a tax increase is, you know, why can't you tighten your belts? Why do you need to get more money from the taxpayers? Um, it's important to start by, <clears throat> by setting the stage that not all of the funding that we receive is on a level playing field. Not all created equal. Over 70% of the dollars that we get in have some sort of restriction attached to them. Uh, <clears throat> whether that's a state restriction where it can only be used on this type of spending, or it's a federal program that has certain objectives that we have to meet. When you look at these two red uh, portions of the pie chart, that is the percent of our budget that we have essentially complete control over. We can make programming decisions um, and do what's best for the district <clears throat> in uh, cutting costs and, you know, pinching pennies, if you will. Um, in other areas, if we make cuts, the money, if we don't spend it, might go back to the state. It might go back to you know, the, the federal government in the form of federal grants. So making cuts in those areas is not always effective. And in some cases that does tie our hands in terms of being able to cut programming to, to realize savings. So that's, that's an important context to have as we go forward. This is, um, a carryover from last month's presentation, but it does bear repeating as we talk about the operating side of the house. Um, this, the local revenue that we receive from property taxes is essentially flat over time. Um, <clears throat> this has to do with the fact that reassessment has not happened in a very long time, and we'll get to that in the second part. But, <clears throat> um, because of that, really the only way that our revenues go up over time is by seeking a tax increase uh, because our tax base is not growing in any way. So <clears throat> as our expenditures increase, which unfortunately just continues to happen, um, you know, inflation happens to every budget, ours is not any exception. So those expenses go up over time. And if we are not going out at some point to seek a revenue increase, we move into deficit spending and <clears throat> eventually um, we have to either get more revenue in or we have to start implementing cuts. So why do we need more? <clears throat> um, as I mentioned last month, the operating deficit that we had at the end of the last fiscal year was $5.7 million. Essentially, this means that we spent $5.7 million more last year than we took in in revenue. Now we have cash reserves, because if we go back to the previous slide, the little green triangles, we build up a reserve of surplus <clears throat> because usually when that tax increase goes into effect, we've asked for a little bit more than we need at that point in time, and that carries us through over, over a longer period <clears throat> and a number of years. So we do have reserves that we're using to balance the budget right now, 
but we are drawing down those cash reserves and <clears throat> it is now time for us to go out and, and get additional revenues. So without those revenues, we are looking at about $6 million that needs to be cut out of our budget for next year. Now again, to the pie chart, that $6 million that has to come out of our discretionary resources, which only accounts for about 27% of our budget. So when you look at some of our discretionary budgets, <clears throat> I just wanted to put some, some numbers on here for some context. And this is all coming from our discretionary dollars. We do receive other dollars that are restricted in some of these areas, like safety and security. There's a safety and security grant that the state provides. That's not in this number because we have to spend that money on safety and security, right? So the 795 that's on this slide, that's the discretionary dollars that we are choosing as a district to invest in safety and security because that funds our constables, <clears throat> it funds a lot of the different program, uh, programming and initiatives that we're doing to enhance safety and security around the district. But that's about $800,000. When you look at the facilities, um, maintenance budgets, the custodial budget, <clears throat> outside of restricted dollars that come from the state to maintain our buildings, that's less than $2 million. Every single school principal receives a budget to operate their schools on a day-to-day -day basis. Add up all those budgets, it's only $1.2 million. So, you know, I won't go through the last couple, but you can see that there's not a ton of money here that we can cut without making drastic cuts to get to that $6 million number. We would have to eliminate virtually all of these budgets to come up with that $6 million and we wouldn't be able to operate um, if those cuts had to be enacted. The other thing to understand in the context here <clears throat> is that 83s and uh, some of the local benefits that we offer to our employees, because when we hire someone, <clears throat> um, in most cases, the state puts a portion up, but we have a local obligation that we have to meet um, in, in hiring and, and putting staff out. So 83% of our discretionary funds are um, going to salary and benefits for staff. So <clears throat> we did want to take some time to talk about the fiscal responsibility um, that we believe we have shown you know, since the last referendum. Um, we looked at discretionary budget growth. Again, I'm, <clears throat> I'm living in that, those two slices of that pie chart because that really is where um, the, that is the bulk of your local tax dollars being put to work. We made some key investments in, um, in, in the key areas that you see there since the last referendum. I mentioned security already, um, you know, hiring constables, bringing, <clears throat> bringing folks on uh, to enhance this, the security and safety of our buildings. Um, we have seen an increase in the amount of money that we are spending annually on facilities and maintenance Again, our, our buildings are aging, so as time marches on, those repairs become more extensive and, and um, expensive. <clears throat> we have invested in uh, student wellness. That is an area where we've seen a lot of needs growing, especially coming out of the, excuse me, the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> so we've made some investments in services in that area to be responsive to our students. Um, we have also, we have made some investments in compensation. Um, today's environment, staffing shortages are everywhere you look. If we do not stay competitive, we will lose the well-trained uh, staff that is doing great things in our classrooms and our schools every day. So we wanna retain the talent that we have. And so we've been investing in compensation to make sure that we can retain that talent. The last one here, substitute costs, this one is a little bit out of our control, um, but it's important to note <clears throat> that because of all those staffing shortages, we wanna make sure it started after the last successful referendum. So once those dollars were approved and, and started to hit our bank accounts, we've only increased discretionary budget growth by 5%. <clears throat> the other thing to note is that we have spent a lot of time and energy on pursuing other funding opportunities, 
whether that's competitive grants or um, funding programs that the state is offering, you know, to bring more dollars <clears throat> to the district, like the uh, the energy efficiency program that we um, that we did a, a couple years ago to en enable us to enhance our facilities, make some needed repairs and improvements um, while saving while saving energy costs in the long run, um, but doing that without any sort of tax increases or any um, ask of the community. This number is actually outdated. <clears throat> we were, my team revised this after I put this together. The number is actually closer to uh, $27 million. It's $26.7 million that we've invested or that we've been able to secure since the last referendum in outside funding. Now, the problem with this is, well, wait a minute. If you're able to get that much, why can't you just keep getting it? These are competitive programs. And unfortunately, a lot of times what happens is, like we got the COPS grant. That's a federal grant offered by the Department of Justice for school safety and security. We've applied for it two or three times since we got the first one. And once you get the first one, you go to the bottom of the list in terms of competitiveness because, okay, well, you got yours. We're gonna let other schools have their chance. Hopefully we'll, we'll be successful in a future application. But because of the competitive nature, we can't count on that revenue. Um, and <clears throat> so we try to be very strategic about what we're investing um, what we're spending that money on when we when we get those opportunities but again that's that's almost 30 million dollars worth of programming that we were able to put in place without asking colonial residents for any additional dollars so this again is a repeat of what we what I showed last month but I do think it's important <clears throat> to again note that among the districts in Newcastle County Colonial currently has the lowest tax rate, and if you look at the districts to the side, um, the three other districts, APO, I think most of us know that unfortunately they were not successful in their ask uh, last month. <clears throat> Red Clay and uh, Brandywine also have referendum in February, and we wish them success, um, <clears throat> but, oop, sorry, but if those are successful, even if they are not successful, we will still be the lowest um, tax rate in Newcastle County. So that's that's where we are with our operating. I, <clears throat> in terms of just a little bit more detail on why the need and, and why we're coming to you now with, with this request. Uh, the next section I'm gonna talk about is reassessment. How is it going to impact us in the district and revenues and how is it going to impact you as a taxpayer so the big thing that is super important to start with whenever you talk about um, property taxes is that your assessed value has absolutely nothing to do with the market value or the price that you paid for your home or what you could sell it for in today's market um, I have a little screenshot here of a property in in the district um, that was sold on the 29th of, of um, December of last year. It sold for $250,000. Down here on the right-hand corner um, is the tax assessment. The taxes are charged or, or assessed at $45,800. So <clears throat> there is um, a large gap between the market value and what you get for your house in the market versus the tax base that you're being charged on when your property tax bill is calculated. Um, assessed values can vary over, you know, all over the place, which is one of the reasons why there was a lawsuit brought forward several years ago that the counties lost. Um, so because of that lawsuit, all three counties are embarking on under a comprehensive reassessment. Um, Newcastle County is due to have the updated assessment data um, ready for implementation in July of 2025. So not not this coming fiscal year, but the, the year after. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So when we talk about property taxes, how does that equate to Colonial's revenue? There's two simple factors that you need to look at. The tax base, which is a combination of all of the assessment values district-wide. 
commercial properties, industrial properties, residential properties, businesses, everybody gets added up together. And the assessments total together equal the tax base. Colonials right now is, is right about $3 billion. You multiply that, the rate is what, I do a presentation every year in July to the board, um, <clears throat> but the rate is what you get charged on and in, in um, the way that our rates work here, it's per $100 of assessed value. So our tax rate is $2.6.6. .6. So we, you're getting charged $2.6.6 .6 on every $100 of assessed value that your home has. And that calculation is what leads to our local revenue. So this slide is a little bit busy, but <clears throat> the intent here is to show that Delaware law requires, it is statutorily required, that when a reassessment occurs, the tax rate has to be reset in order to be revenue neutral, which essentially means that we have to get the same money, the same amount of money after the reassessment as we were getting before the reassessment. The way that that happens, so that on the top, the houses are little, representing the smaller, lower assessed values. After the reassessment below, the values go up. So as the assessed values get closer to the market value, that means that we, can, we have to lower our tax rate in order to get the same, come up with the same amount of revenue on the back end. So two sides of an equation and they kind of move in opposite directions to get you to the same outcome, right? If our tax base doubles, then our tax rate gets cut in half and that equals the same amount of revenue that we started with, okay? Now it's important to note that the law does allow school boards easy numbers <clears throat> If we're generating $50 million now, the, the law would allow the school board to tell me we want to generate $55 million, right? We're adding that 10% onto the $50 million. <clears throat> we're going to generate $55 million, and that's a 10% increase. But I still have to reset the tax rate down to only get that $55 million. Or they could say, let's take 5%. I don't know what that decision is going to be when the school board has that, um, that decision in front of them. <clears throat> but we are essentially required to reset so that we are not getting any additional dollars out of a reassessment. So that's all great for us. What does it mean for taxpayers, for residents? <clears throat> so unfortunately, determining how your property will be impacted by reassessment it's impossible to do it in advance. Um, but you know, the, the major principle that we want to hone in on here does have to do with that resetting of the rate. So the individual property, you have to look at in comparison to how the overall tax base gets changed. Mm -hmm. So in our earlier example, I mentioned, let's just assume that our tax base, right, the amount of, um, the, the cumulative value of properties in Colonial doubles. That means the rate gets cut in half. If your property doubles, the value of your property doubles, then your tax bill is not gonna change because even though your assessment doubles, your rate is gonna get cut in half the way I've done for the whole tax base. If your property triples in value or goes up more than, you know, the, um, it more than doubles, you might see an increase because your property's increased value has outpaced the overall district base. But conversely, if your property has grown at a slower rate than the overall growth in the district, then you may actually see a lower bill than you had before. Because if your property's uh, value relative to the overall tax base hasn't grown as much, then you could actually see a decrease in your property tax bill after reassessment. This, this is the really tricky part. 
Um, it, is, <clears throat> it is tough to understand, um, but the, the main thing to know, and you know, I work with my colleagues a lot statewide, and Kent County is a year ahead of us. They are actually gonna be implementing reassessment in this coming July. And residents in, in Kent County have already gotten letters telling them what their new assessed values are. And the, the rate resetting, that message is not widely understood. So everyone thinks that, oh my God, my house has gone from this and it's quadrupled, my taxes are gonna skyrocket. That would be true, except we have to reset the rate backwards. So if the entire district in Kent County quadruples, the rate gets cut by, by you know, it would, it would be 25% of what it was originally to maintain that neutral, that flat funding level. I say revenue neutral and people don't know what that means. So we can't get any more money after reassessment than we're getting right now unless the school board chooses to take that, that little bit extra that they're allowed to under, under Delaware law. All right, so that's reassessment. Um, that's what we know as of right now, because your guess is as good as mine what the, the rates are gonna do in Newcastle County. No one's gotten reassessed since 1983. And it is important to understand <clears throat> that even properties built after 1983 are still assessed based on what, it, what their home would have been worth in 1983. So a home built in 2023 gets backwards mapped to say, okay, what would it have cost if it was on the books in 1983? Which is why we got sued, because it makes no sense. Okay, we're gonna move on to capital projects. <clears throat> and again, these are the ones, these are our major renovation projects that we are asking to um, issue bonds for, and we'll pay, it, pay the cost of the project over time. So, we submitted these requests. The, the requests get packaged into what's called a Certificate of Necessity request. That's what the CN stands for. Um, those get submitted in the fall. And <clears throat> we submitted the same uh, projects last year and we were denied. This year, the state decided to approve the projects and agree with us that we, we needed these um, projects done. So they have set aside over $70 million of capital funding that the state will provide for these projects. That's 60% of the value of the projects. The catch is that colonial taxpayers have to agree to pay the remaining 40%, which is just under $50 million. If we do not, um, if the colonial community decides not to approve this request, the state will reallocate that $70 million somewhere else. We do not get to keep it. We don't get to do 60% of our projects. Um, it gets reallocated to other districts, other state agencies, wherever there's other need. Um, so the colonial portion is critical to getting that $70 million to actually land here in Colonial and benefit our schools and our kids. So again, this, <clears throat> this is an overview overview from last time or last month, but it's important again to, to point out that our schools are on average 60 years old. Anybody who owns a home knows that over time you have to put money into it. You have to put roof a roof in, you have to replace your air conditioner. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the stuff in our, um, around our district is at the point where it simply needs replacement. It is not a reflection of um, poor management or poor maintenance or you know anything other than simply age. Time marches on and we need to upgrade and invest in our buildings. So <clears throat> we wanted to zero in tonight on the projects here at William Penn. And the overall project um, total that we have is again that $121 million. <laughs> 67.8 million of that is slated for William Penn. And I know that athletic fields, the, a new athletic complex is what gets talked about most often. I know I'm, a lot of you are probably thinking, oh my gosh, almost $70 million for new athletic fields. That's crazy. That seems, that seems really outrageous. So let's dive into the details. Not all of that 
67 million, 68 <clears throat> million is slated for the athletic complex, okay? We've got 1.2 million for security enhancements. We've got um, five and a half million for uh, basically redoing the parking lot and, and the sidewalks around the building. <clears throat> Replacing the roof on this building is gonna cost us $10.5 million. And the athletic facilities do cost about 50 million. How that breaks down in terms of the components of, the, um, of what we're getting for that. The field house that is <clears throat> um, a companion to the, the stadium costs about 25 million to construct or it's budgeted to cost that. The stadium and fields around, <clears throat> including the bleachers and, and press box and so forth, add another 13. Um, constructing the track that will go around the field is another two. Under the current proposal, um, the tennis courts would be relocated to where Bill Cole Stadium is currently, um, and that will cost about 1.5 million to get those under, get those constructed. We are also rehabbing our baseball and softball fields, new dugouts, um, regraded fields, new bleachers, and then <clears throat> um, a lot of stormwater management and kind of the miscellaneous site work that goes along with all these major projects costs about another six million. So for folks who have not been around and walked around the campus and seen the state of our facilities today, we wanted to include a little, some visual, visual evidence here. The Bill Cole Stadium picture is a little bit hard to see, but um, you can see that it's boxed in, right? The top left, that red band, that's the track. It doesn't go around the field, but it's adjacent to the field. The baseball field is what's on the right. That uh, the tan little semicircle there is one of our baseball fields. And then this conglomeration of buildings here is our greenhouse space and, and where our ag program has some, um, some structures. Our, our beehives are there, our goat pens, um, a lot of the <clears throat> agricultural aspects that William Penn offers are right in that area. These big white things are bleachers. And then we've got some maintenance buildings here. Um, tennis courts, they're not in great shape. They are, frankly, they're unplayable. Um, and then, I'm not sure, I think this picture might be from earlier today, um, but this, this is what our football field looks like when it rains. It gets flooded, there's a lot of puddling, and becomes a big mess. When you go into, when you're a William Penn athlete and you have an away game, this is what you see. This is what you play on. This is what our kids see when they're going away from, you know, an away game. <clears throat> These are fairly recent. I know Odessa, I think, just opened within the last two years. St. George's is a little bit older. I think it's within the last 10, five to 10. Um, <clears throat> but again, you can see, you know, multi-sport fields, track around them, turf fields. And the charters and private schools are, are not left out of the mix either. Um, this <clears throat> on the left is Abyssinia Stadium up in Wilmington for Silesianum. And Newark Charter just opened um, a nice new stadium for its school uh, this, this year. So this is the standard now. This is kind of, uh, this is just what comes with building a new high school or, you know, <clears throat> um, standard athletic complex for high school. This is what we're, this is what it looks like. <clears throat> so a little bit more context around, um, around just some of the numbers in general. Um, <clears throat> if we were to go to the state today and say we want to build a high school the same size as William Penn, they have a formula that they, <clears throat> that they do to determine what, how to budget uh, to plan for these construction projects. This building would be budgeted to cost almost $180 million to build today. Because I know, you know, $50 million sounds like a ton of money. But when you compare it to how much it's costing to build schools in today's environment, 
you start to level out and see that it's it's not out it's not unreasonable given some of the other costs that we've seen and i will i will tell you that in the most recent few years almost all of the schools that have been funded have gone over budget and the districts have come back and said hey that formula that you use to determine what we need to what we're going to spend it's too low so that 178 is arguably too low based on what um, the recent experiences in actually putting you know building a school so just context for where that 50 million dollar number sits in kind of the the grand scheme of school construction in today's environment the other thing and i've touched on this a little bit but <clears throat> most of the facilities here at penn we have we have maintained them and love them and cared for them as much as we possibly can. And, and the only thing to do at this point is to completely replace them and overhaul the facility. Um, I won't flip back to the picture, but I took the time to point out all of the things around Bill Cole Stadium. There is no way to expand the footprint of that stadium without having to move all of those things and reconfigure all of those things. And all of that would come with with cost and and you know site work and <clears throat> reconfiguration um, to build a football stadium in the spot where it is we wouldn't have the multi-sport usage you know there, there's a lot of factors that we'd lose if we just kind of put a new stadium in the same location and, and chose not to expand <clears throat> and additionally we probably couldn't build the stadium as it is now brand new because it may not be ADA compliant and it may not be Title IX compliant um, based on today's environment. So what are the benefits? I'm not, I'm not going to read through every bullet point here. Um, but the, the benefits are that, you know, a, a turf field, the maintenance is a lot easier. The turnover time in terms of how quickly it can be uh, transition from one sport to another is a lot quicker. Um, there are multiple benefits that um, that will, you know, the entire community will will see the benefit of. Um, additionally, not just for sports, but our, our band, our color guard, our drum line, they will have better practice facilities. Um, you know, when they go to tournaments and things, they are probably not walking on grass. And, and walking on a field that's in the condition that our, our field is in, or our parking lot, which is where they practice a lot of the times. So they'll be able to practice on a field that is much closer to where they would be competing. Um, and then there's other, you know, a lot of other uses that we could um, add back into the complement of things that we can do here at Penn that currently we just don't have the space for and the facilities are just not built to accommodate um, a, lot of, a lot of the things going on. Um, including a lot of the community uses. Um, you know, <clears throat> because of the temperamental nature of our, of our grass fields, we have to manage and mitigate how many community groups are using our fields, when they can use them, et cetera. With the turf field, it'll be a lot easier to, to get other community groups to access to use our, our facilities um, <clears throat> and be able to benefit from, from them in that way. So it's time, and this, you know, this is our this is our tagline for this uh, referendum. We know our kids deserve this. You've seen what they walk into when they go to other facilities. Um, <clears throat> our staff deserve it. We have staff that are so dedicated and are doing, you know, great things for kids every day. And we know that you, as a community, deserve this uh, because the <clears throat> the investing in education is you know the best way that a community can tell tell its kids that it cares and so we we know that colonial nation deserves it and we do hope we will have your support in the uh in february and we'll move into the question and answer session at this point we have one and potentially another one coming um i'll uh you take a look at that one definitely in your wheelhouse this is a great question. Okay, I have 
to uh, let me let me do a non technical slash taxes based responses here to a couple of questions. Give Ms. Falcon a bit of a breather. How's that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, first off, we have one from uh, tell us how to help get out get the information out. Uh, Molly, thank you. We'll be reaching out to you shortly to talk to you about what we're planning. You know how we're seeking support. That's a great question. Well, we've an approach we've taken with this campaign this this time, as opposed to last time in other referendums, is we want to know what do you need from us to be a champion for this campaign. So we want to learn from you what spaces you're in, where you are, who you're talking to, and how can we help you. If you want us to come out and speak, we're there. If you need materials, we're there. Our website is chock full of all this information. This PowerPoint will be on the website. This video will be on the website. Each one of these sections will be on the website with more detailed overview of all the content. We want to provide the public with as much information as possible to understand what's happening but also help those who are champions for us carry the message. So Molly, we will definitely be reaching out to you. Ms. Williams, you hit the nail on the head. As we move forward after this presentation, we're going to be, we will continue to celebrate the great things in Colonial since the last referendum. And we will be sharing that as we move forward into February. So that's a great question that we will have more like detail so it's not just off the cuff, like there's actual documentation timeline when things happen. So those are definitely part of the plan to celebrate some of the great things that happened since 2016 when we went to, re 2017 when we went to referendum. Because uh, I do remember we did a lot of door knocking and a lot of talking back then. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Emily. She's got one other question. <clears throat> okay, I actually have two. Um, <clears throat> So the first one basically says, given that Colonial has the lowest tax rate in Newcastle County, why are we asking for the lowest increase of all the districts in the county? I love this question. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, I, I could ask for more. Um, we and taxes year. yes, we did. We our tax rate actually we lowered the taxes by 11 cents last year, um, <clears throat> but we do recognize that. You know, asking residents to dip lower into their pockets and give us more money, it's not something that we take lightly and we don't do it without, uh, you know, looking at all the couch cushions and, and figuring out as many things that we can do um, before we do that. And 40 cents is a responsible number. Um, that will get us the same, roughly the same time frame, you know, three to five years. Uh, of operations <clears throat> and to ask for anything more you know we, we do have to balance the community's willingness to support us um, there are some districts that and and it's becoming more and more rare but there are some districts that you know Cape Henlopen is one that I can think of where sure go ahead ask for more because you know the tax base down there is pretty well to do, you've got the beach communities and a lot of vacation homes, et cetera. But we know in Colonial that we have to be financially responsible. We have to be, uh, we have to keep an eye on sustainability and we don't wanna ask for too much, right? We are, we are not a bank. The point is not to sit on a bunch of cash um, that, we, <clears throat> that we project that we're gonna need in five years, right? We're trying to keep the window in three to five year time frame because if we get a, too big of a surplus, then we don't think it's fair that we're sitting on a bunch of taxpayer dollars that we don't have use for just yet. So it's that balance of, of not, wanting, not wanting to have to come out and ask you guys every single year because that's obviously not very efficient. But again, we, we don't wanna be sitting on gigantic cash reserves because then that's money that we're taking out of your pocket that we don't need yet. We'd rather keep it in your pocket as long as possible. All right, um, another question is, who does the contracts, qualified bid, timing of construction, um, how, does it, how does it affect seniors, and are we, how are we planning to energize the community? Um, I think Dr. Menzer talked a little bit about the energizing the community portion. Um, in terms of the contracts and bids, I'm assuming that was a reference to the construction. Uh, 
So the procurement process is managed in my office. Um, the bidding process is <clears throat> essentially we, we work in partnership with Data Service Center, which is an organization that we are actually co-owners with. Um, Red Clay School District and us own this. It's a separate organization, but they, um, they have a bidding specialist or a contract specialist that understands the state procurement laws and the bid requirements that we have to follow. We work with her to put the bids out and make sure that we are in compliance. Um, <clears throat> but that, that is an ongoing thing that you know my office is heavily involved in, um, in making sure that we are, we utilize state contracts whenever we can. Um, so the state, state government is putting out contracts for all sorts of things. Um, when, when they are a good deal, because in some cases schools can get a better deal than the state can. Technology is a great example of that. But when the state's got a good deal, we, we utilize those whenever possible. Um, and you know, DSC uh, partners with us in, in putting, managing our contracts. What was the point of creating that organization with Red Clay? What was the political point? I don't know, it's before my time. It was way before. So this was, was it to be able to possibly procure lower uh, rates of, it sounds, it sounds like that was kind of hard. Yeah, that's a that's a history lesson we have to go into, Chris. Uh, it's a long. That, yeah. That's been around for a, quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, there was a component in here about how this affects seniors. Um, <clears throat> so, new cap, the state offers senior what's called senior property tax relief. Um, it is. I'm asking about the school. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Um, it's, so. It's because that construction's been on. I'm yeah. assuming. Yeah, the seniors this year won't realize any of the benefits. No, no, I, I know that. I'm saying the seniors that would have that year. So, so, like, how are they going to be impacted in terms of school operations? Well, school operations and also um, their ability to take part in set football or something like that during that time. That's a great question. Um, and I'm going to be honest, we've not done uh, a revamping of our athletic facilities before so there are a lot of details like that that we're gonna have to work out and work you know work with the partners that we have um, <clears throat> you know other districts we can obviously learn from them and how they've managed these type of things um, as well as our um, you know engineering and architectural partners <clears throat> that we work with on how uh, you know experiences that they've seen in other areas on how to manage or phase in construction uh, so that there's minimal disruption to, to students and the activities going on. There tends to yeah. be a lot of sharing of facilities. I know when Sally's at, at Cineo was being built, there was utilization of other facilities. Howard did the same thing. Like a, a lot of times our athletic director will get very creative uh, in use of space. Uh, so I have five more uh, cards. I'm just gonna uh, kind of churn through them. Uh, some of them I'll be able to answer, others I will not. Um, are the teachers involved in providing feedback and needed updates? Yes, we're involved regularly with our teachers at a variety of levels, whether the building level, the district level, the union level, um, the school level, cross uh, air interest area and employee groups. They're involved in many of the conversations around our decisions, um, and they also, we regularly have feedback around our negotiated agreements for employment, which include uh, environment, climate, materials, supplies, and the such. So there, we are regularly uh, involved with them in terms of uh, getting feedback. And they got, they were also given an opportunity to provide a ton of feedback on the information you saw here, uh, and as well as asking them for what do we need to help them become uh, champions for their campaign. Uh, the next question is, uh, with Colonial School District scoring well below average in academic achievement, how do we justify to parents that they should pay more to accommodate sports program and construction? Uh, the two go, the two definitely go hand in hand. Um, you know, students who are engaged both in the classroom as well as in the playing fields or on the uh, activities, uh, they definitely achieve better. Right now, our test scores are definitely uh, don't reflect the level of achievement we believe our students are, are gaining. Um, We've done some of our own analysis that will be, we have actually some data that we're gonna be sharing that when we look at our students on the standardized uh, assessments that we use at our K2, 3, 5, and middle school level, that while our students aren't uh, 
performing off the charts, they're definitely meeting a, a higher standard uh, than the, the kind that we represent, that's represented on the SMARTER. Um, SMARTER scores are down across the state. SMARTER NAEP scores are down across the state. It's something that's a concern. Um, there's no uh, mystery or magic to justify one over the other. Time is right now. We have the money in hand, $70 million, $70 million -ish from the state to improve our facility. We can't use that for anything but that. So we have to take advantage of that. The operating, we're asking to continue to do what we're doing and improve our academic standing uh, with, the, with the methods and the curriculums we've, we util, we're utilizing now. Some of the data we're gonna share, we believe reflects that our students are achieving better than we're showing on our test scores. In the, in the, the bottom line, that's what I'm saying, is if you looked at our teacher's data, our school data on our assessments that we're using, you would see more growth. Uh, from our, whether it's ELA, math, science, or social studies. Um, what demographics will be affected most by the tax hike? Love it when I get a question in the name on here, the student's name I recognize from back in the day. It's always interesting. Uh, so that's a tough one to answer as well because I don't know what the tax hike is gonna mean uh, until we see what it, you know, what the, uh, when it gets approved. But I think it's proportional and depending on, you know, what, your, what, the, what someone's income is would determine how much of an impact it has on them as, a, as an individual or a family. Um, obviously, a lower assessed value home will have a lower rate and a higher assessed value home will have a higher rate. I can only really speak to the value on the property. Is that my problem? Did I say that wrong? Well, the rate doesn't change. The rate doesn't change. The amount we get off of the, the rate will be higher if you have a higher value home. So in terms of home pricing, that's what I can say. And if you extrapolate that out from someone who has a higher value home than someone who's, you know, they're still, they're paying more, but they have more. If someone has less, they're, they would pay less, but it's all relative. I don't have the answer to how it's gonna affect each individual. To Ms. Falcon's point earlier, we recognize that asking for an increase is going to be affecting everybody and everybody in their own way. And it's not something we do lightly. Um, that what I was gonna reference is, is that if you are a senior, you are eligible to apply for help from the state for, for relief. So I do know that's one demographic that does have some relief when it comes to tax rate. Veterans and, also have And veterans also have the same option. Um, this is a really great question, and it's one that's got me scratching my head, so I kind of put it last, so I'm gonna slide it down to the lower part again. Um, uh, will the track tennis and pick, this one's easier, so I'm gonna go with this one first, all right? Will the track, tennis, and pickleball courts be open to the general public? It'll be open. We will be figuring out a way to make the tennis courts available like the ones out front used to be available when they were playable. So yes, the answer to that is yes. What is the occupancy rate of students in schools and what are the projections? I'm not sure occupancy, I think it's meant like attendance rate. That I don't have right off the top of my head. Or is it capacity? Or capacity, I'm not really sure. One or the other. Oh, so we are, at some of our schools, we are at, at William Penn, we are at capacity with roughly, there's 2,200 students uh, here. The capacity is about 2,300. Um, some of our other schools are not as fully enrolled and our enrollment is actually down from pre-pandemic era and is you know projected to maintain that level and potentially kind of flatline and dip down, up and down over the next several years. We're down. Numbers of students total. 8,900 8, students ish right now total, and so that's the you know the, the best thing. and the projections we get them from uh, different agencies across the state and data service centers. We start looking to next year. We don't have that definitive yet. That was just to William Penn's point, because of what's going on here, we'll be able to, we'll also free up space to increase capacity because some of the program, some of the rooms here, the, like the weight room will shift over to the field house. The locker room, some of the locker room needs will shift to the field house. Essentially that creates behind me here to the left, like 
pretty large chunk of the building that's kind of up to be re-examined in terms of how the space is being utilized. Um, so there is a, the, that does increase our capacity here at William Penn. It doesn't address the middle schools, but it, it, it is an, an example of how capacity ebbs and flows based on the programming in the building, but also our enrollment does ebb and flow based on the population in the community. Okay. Um, the other question on here, the process for who gets cut and what would get cut if it doesn't pass or how, where we're going to trim that to make up that deficit, that's a process that we're working on right now. I don't have an answer for that. There is, a, there is we have to make decisions around staffing as well as programming as you saw on the slide. And that's not something that we take lightly. I would be, it would be flip of me to just comment on that off the cuff. But we do have a process and a plan in place to examine our budget. We go through it every year. This year, we're just kind of taking an extra a look at it um, in terms of what we would need to do if the, if we were unsuccessful. And I can let. Would it come to a school board vote? Maybe the whole thing make up. Not not necessarily. They would approve the budget, but the budgets get approved on uh, like we still have not approved the budget for this school year. The final budget. The final budget. The preliminary budget is approved in August, and then the final budget is approved usually January, February. So it's, it's a lag approval, but it's a preliminary approval. I, I just want to add that context again about the revenue, you know, the, the source of the revenue. Um, again, over 70% of the money we are receiving annually we could make cuts in those areas and the money just simply goes back to the state, right? There's not a way for us to reprogram dollars to, uh, to <clears throat> kind of actually get cuts out of the system. Um, and that's, because if we can't, if we make a cut and we can't keep the money and reprogram it for our needs, then we're not, you know, we're not doing anything useful. So um, that does drive a lot of decision, the decision making because there are programs that it makes no sense to cut because all we would be doing is handing money back to the state. Uh, so that, that factors in large. And that unfortunately does put us in the situation where everybody says, well, you, you cut all this stuff, you cut activities, you cut the, the stuff that impacts kids and, and <clears throat> you know, there's their, um, the fun stuff. Unfortunately, the fun stuff is the stuff that we don't have any restricted money telling us we have to do these fun things. So it unfortunately does become something that it's one of those items that, because it's not, it's not funded with any sort of restricted dollars, it is unfortunately on a relatively short list of things that we can do to make the cuts that we need to make. So in the last question, this is the one that's, uh, William Penn plans to spend 50.6 million on athletics, which comes out of 41% of the, four, almost 41.5% of the board. Do you anticipate the new stadium will benefit at least 41.5% of the students in our district? So I would answer that, how do you determine benefit? Because I, I could go on and on about how the value of having a, a high school that the school and the students and the community are proud of, how when they come up here for Penn Farm Day or when they come up here for the culinary program or when they come up here to participate in band day, uh, and they're not students here like that's a benefit because there's pride in the community pride in the school And it's not something they use every day But the goal would be that it needs to be here when they get here And so they would benefit every student who comes through here I believe would benefit from having those facilities here whether they gain from some of the repositioning Whether they gain from being on that athletic field as an athlete or a drum per, a, a drum a drum line a marching band whether it you name it, whether it's PE class, because they're using fields that they can get out to now that aren't you know, mud and dirt um, during this, the work day. So I answer that, if you, if you define benefit, I say everybody in the district benefits, not just the students, in the, but the community does, because you know, William Penn's the center of the universe as far as I'm concerned, right? And this is where everybody should wanna come. And I, we want it to look and be what we know it can be. And we want the community and our students to be proud of that. So, I mean, that's my answer. It's not a great answer. Like, I can't, I can't measure that one. No, can't pull it. I'm not looking for like a, not really looking for a quantifiable. Yeah.
So when we, we, we do, I would say that, that I agree. Like if I took Kerry Downey, for example, to do the same thing for them that we're doing at William Penn, which is improve their facilities outside for recreation and activities. They're getting a new playground. We're making that not a swamp. We want to fix the parking lot. Like that, relative to William Penn, it's the same exact kind of work. Students will benefit. At William Penn, it's just bigger and there's more going on and the students have more things outside the walls than they do at Cary Downey. So I can't, I, I'm not going to disagree with you that it's larger, it is. Justifying it, it needs to be larger because there's more, it's more complex and it's bigger than a playground and a, uh, you know. Yeah, I'm not saying that the yeah. athletic stadium shouldn't be built. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not even saying that the amount of money that's allocated for it could be allocated for it is too much. Right. I'm just looking at the fact that if we're Well, the, so the, the, the trouble with that is this money is for capital, for facilities and buildings and construction, not those programs. We can't use this money for that. Yeah. That's, the, that's the difference. That's fair. Okay. And, I, uh, and I, would, I would argue that a lot of the programs that you mentioned, they went away because there was not interest, right? The, the, the language program, unfortunately, we tried our best to keep that program going, but we weren't getting the enrollment. That, so it, it didn't make financial sense to continue the program because the amount we had to invest in it for the number of students that were benefiting, that's, that's where you know, we felt like that was um, the most financially responsible decision to make because the resources getting funneled into that program were outsized for the number of students benefiting from that program. So I mean, those are some of the, to the earlier questions, those are some of the tough decisions that get made when you have discretionary money. You have to be responsible with it. And that's kind of what happens. It ebbs and flows. So, thank you. Yeah, so I wanted to say, first off, thank you very much for coming out on this windy day, because that is what you hear there, the wind blowing over top of the, uh, of the auditorium and the gymnasium. Uh, we definitely appreciate your questions. We will definitely be reaching out and following up with you as needed to provide information and support you. We do appreciate it because, I mean, back to the earlier slide, we do believe it's time. It's time for Colonial Nation, uh, the staff, students, families deserve it. So thank you very much and please drive safe uh, and we'll see you at the next forum, hopefully in February. Thank you. And we're gonna go.